Hey everyone, welcome to the stream. Yeah, so uh, I've been pretty busy since the last uh, stream, which was just a couple nights ago. Been working on on Travis. For those of you who don't know, Travis CI is this uh, this really nice continuous integration plugin that you can use for free for uh, GitHub um, projects. Let's see if I can show you guys what I'm talking about. <clears throat> yeah, so you, here you can see for the Vectrexy project, uh, basically I've I've got something going. I've got a Travis uh, file in my repo, and uh, it pretty much works. I've got like most of the kinks ironed out. Right now, I'm dealing with some issues related to just pushing the 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 zip file of the the build to my FTP. And um, once I figure that out, uh, that means that I'll have regular builds being pushed for both Windows and for Linux um, to basically to some space here and then you'll be able to download those builds uh, from basically from my, my github here so like right now I have this Vectrexy Windows and I'll add you know Vectrexy for Linux 64-bit um, and for those of you who actually use Linux you can try it out and let me know you know if it works or if I've missed some missed something um, but yeah so that's what I've been kind of busy on. I don't really want to work on that though on stream. It's kind of like um, a bit tedious. I don't really, uh, I don't think it's really fun to watch. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. If that's something that interests you, let me know. But um, for the most part, it's it's just me hacking at scripts and then pushing changes on this temporary branch and then waiting for Travis to build it and let me know how it goes. And it's kind of this slow iter iterative approach. Um, but yeah, it totally works. So on the note though of having made this build available, um, I got a really cool um, message from someone. So basically there is this this Vectrex, um, kind of like a, what do you call it, like a group on Facebook for fans of the Vectrex. Uh, and I joined it a little while ago, you know, cause since I'm working on Vectrexy, I wanted to see what people are doing. And there's just a lot of people are real hobbyists and real fans and, um, anyway, I, I posted about Vectrexy and about the fact that I had made a Windows build available and one of the people there, uh, it seems like most people there use a Mac or are less interested in emulation and more into the actual running the hardware, the, the real thing, which of course I understand, that's fine. Um, but one of the people did download my emulator and he sent me a really cool message that I just kind of wanted to share because it's, uh, it's pretty much the first real piece of feedback I've gotten. So. This guy, Tony Lindbergh, uh, I hope he doesn't mind that I'm sharing this, but he wrote, wrote to me, Greetings, I have used your Vectrex emulator quite a bit recently. I have made some overlays for some of the homebrews that didn't have one. Uh, will it support so-called merged ROM sets? And he sent me a link here uh, on the main documentation about these merged ROM sets. And I, I, I looked into it. Uh, we could talk a little bit about it after. So he says, like, basically saying it's it's like when you have multiple versions of a ROM, which we do have that for for Vectrexy, right? Uh, for, sorry, for Vectrex, we have like the um, yeah, we'll we'll have like the base version, and then there'll be the, like multiple revisions, the A, the Bs. So uh, anyway, he talks about having them all in a single zip file and kind of supporting them. Um, but here's the best part. He says, I have played many games on the emulator, and all of them worked even some not even finished alpha versions of homebrew games. It feels much more stable than para JVE or mess and MAME, which I've been using in the past, which is pretty awesome. Uh, what appeals to me most is how easy it was to add my own overlays and make them work in the emulator. I didn't even, I didn't have to do anything other than naming the overlay file somewhat similar to the game and place it in the overlay folder. Uh, sound emulation is of course something that would be very nice to have later, but with the games but with the games running flawlessly and simple overlay support, Vectrexy has already become my go-to emulator for Vectrex. I have to say, this is this really, you know, was heartwarming to read because 
you know, I've been working on the simulator for a long time and streaming it and I, when I made this binary available, I was hoping that people would download it and try it out, but I guess, you know, reality hits and there are just not that many people who are <laughs> looking to to play Vectrex, I guess. And, and that's okay, you know, like, I mean, that's not the ultimate goal. Like, I wasn't, like, hoping that I'd get a huge number of fans or anything, but I was hoping at least someone would try it, and, and someone did try it, and is actually saying that... Um, it's become his go-to emulator, and he's saying that it's even better, it's more stable than than Para JVE or Mess and Mame, which is really a surprise. That's really cool. Um, and I love that he he mentions this thing about the overlays because those of you who've been following, um, I actually you know spent quite a bit of time on making the overlay uh, name like fuzzy match support thing work really well. Um, basically. I made, I, like what I did was, I, I spoke about this on previous streams, is the, the, the naming conventions for the ROMs and the overlays are unfortunately very different. You know, like you'll have, uh, let's see if I show here, here are the ROMs, right? And if you go into overlays, let's see if I can find some here, like um, let's say, wow. Well, like for example, we'll have things like, oh, there's underscores in the names or, um, you know, I don't know, like different things, like there's the date and sometimes the version number, and sometimes they're just not quite exactly the same. I wish I could find a ver. There's, there's definitely one of these that doesn't match up well. Let me just take a look. Uh, okay, well, I'm not finding it right now, but suffice to say that some of these just don't match up really well, and I, and I didn't feel like going in and like renaming all of these these overlays, I kind of didn't even want to supply overlays. I was like, well, people may have their own overlays and their own ROMs and their own sets they put together and they may not match. And so what I did was I implemented this fuzzy matching, right? So like basically try to match the strings. And I did that using the Levenstein distance uh, and using that to basically, you know, with, with some threshold say, which is the best match and use that uh, above some threshold. And it works really well for me, and it looks like it worked really well for um, for Tony Lindbergh here. So uh, I'm just really happy to hear that, you know. So um, and as as for sound, it's definitely on the menu. I will be working on sound emulation uh, at some point. It's going to be really interesting to do that. So once that's in, I mean that that should be, I think, pretty much the last major feature. Um, so yeah, I just kind of wanted to share that. I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, all right, so back to our regular programming. So last stream, two nights ago, let's get into uh, Ubuntu here. Okay, I'm just gonna open my task manager to keep my eye on CPU usage as it tends to spike. Okay. So yeah, um, let's get in here. So last last stream was a little bit frustrating, to be honest. I spent a couple hours just, uh, well, maybe not the whole time there, but let's say about a, ch a good chunk of it, an hour, an hour and a bit, um, trying desperately to get the, um, to get this code to be able to set focus on the different windows, uh, mainly trying to set focus on that terminal that we start from, right? Because the, the terminal ends up being my debugger, right? That's my debug window. Uh, on Windows, this works. I did have to do a couple of things on Windows, a couple of magical things to get to work, but it wasn't all that hard, to be, to be honest. Um, but it seems like it is not at all the same thing on Linux. Um, and you know, I've heard before that, you know, the the part of the Linux ideology is that nothing should ever steal focus from what you're doing. Uh, I think there's some exceptions to that. Like if you run an application from the terminal, it will switch focus to the thing you just ran, which usually is what you want. But um, like f normally, applications that pop windows, unless they're like a child dialog or something like that, typically they, you know, if you spawn another process or something like that. You can't really uh, set the focus. It's not the Linux way, and I and I get it because it can be really annoying in Windows. Well, you'll be typing something and then a pop-up appears and takes the focus, and then like you 
you accidentally hit escape at that moment and close it or hit enter and clicked OK on something you didn't want to. Uh, it's pretty frustrating when that happens. But, um... Yeah, so it's frustrating when it happens on Windows, and I guess... Like, I'm basically fighting against a system in Linux that's just not really well supported. Uh, and to that end, I actually thought it was this was interesting. So, after the stream, and you know, I think it was the day after, I was looking into it a bit more, and I, I tried to, to attack it from a different angle, rather than uh, which what I did last stream, which was looking at um, I was looking more at the APIs around uh, what's it called again? Um, sorry, the name is escaping me. Um, the windowing manager. Uh, Give me a sec. I want to see in platform. GTK. That's it. I don't know why my little brain fart there. Uh, I was focusing on GTK because, you know, GTK is what's used for the open file dialog, and I thought that's where I'll find my answers. But actually, I decided to go a little bit lower level to the X Windows, um, X11 stuff. Uh, and then you'll see some code here about that. There's like this um, X open display and X raise window and X event and all that. Uh, I got some of this code online and I tried it and honestly nothing I'm doing actually works. Uh, interestingly, I went and dug a little bit into the, um, the way SDL actually does it. Because of course SDL is able to focus windows. You know, I, I realize when you call SDL set focus or something, set window focus, you pass it in an SDL window, Deep inside that code, it's got to be setting the focus on Linux, and, I'm, and and so I went to go look at that code. Let me see if I can show it to you guys, because it was kind of funny. Um, let's see where was it again? Oh, I may have lost. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I will find it. If I go into SDL here, yeah, that's the right place. And it was under, what was the source again? Sorry, just give me one second, I'll, I'll find it. Um, oh, I hate this search. I'll just use my trusty total commander. Uh, SDL I'm just basically looking you know what I should actually instead search for something more like SDL.h that's gonna be a lot smarter maybe not the header file I kind of want a CPP file can I uh... We'll find it. Because I want to show you guys just like how complex, how incredibly complex the code, the implementation just for setting focus um, on Linux is compared to Windows. I just thought it was kind of funny. It's, it's actually kind of hilarious. Okay, here we go. Source, SDL, here we go, SDL video. I think this is it. go here so, okay Windows and I think it's SDL let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. must be the video video one here uh, no like that and let's go for focus no great bit all over the place here. I, it is in here somewhere. Maybe the, the X11 version here. Was it X11 window for the focus stuff? X11 
set. Okay, so there's this X11 set focus. Okay, here. Oh, sorry. It was okay. It was in the wrong place. Source video. Okay, here we go. And I, and I wanted to kind of contrast that with the other one here. So this is yes, yeah, set window input focus for the device. Set. Show window, raise window. These are all these functions here, right? But these are like kind of internal. Let me go back to the find results. And then here's the actual function. Okay, and then I love to contrast this with the one for Windows. It should be under Windows here. And it should be SDL, like window window or something. Screen. Get window. Hmm. Set focus. Uh, set. Is this the right place? Actually, I don't think I'm looking in the right place. Unfortunately. Yeah, it is, it is SDL set window input focus. That is the, the main function we're looking for. Okay, so this is SDL video C. It calls set if this set window is still supported. Otherwise, it calls this set window input focus. This and window. Okay, and then that's it. So that is the function that we're looking for. I don't know why I'm not finding the version for Windows though in here. Super odd. Oh no, it was not that, it was raise window. Of course. SDL raise window. Okay, that's why I'm not finding it. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, we'll get there. All right, so there's STL raise window, the base implementation, and then that calls raise window. Now we should be able to find, here we go, Windows version, which is called win raise window. Okay, so this, this is what I wanted to show you. So on, on Windows, when you call SDL raise window, this is what it does. It grabs the HWIND and it calls one function 
set foreground window. That's it, right? Nothing more. That's all you gotta do. Now, let's contrast that with what, what it does on, on GTK or like, no, actually not on X11. So if we go to the X11 version of the same function, so that's X11 raise window, right? Uh, where's the implementation? Here. So this is the, the X11 version. Now at the outset, it looks simple, right? But actually it's making calls to this X11 X raise window followed by set window active, followed by X11 X flush. And this function, actually I couldn't find it for some reason, but if this is a nest, this is not a, a X11 function, it's an internal function that they wrote. X11 X raise window, so I have to, I don't know where this is. Then set window active is the one that is actually in here. And this one has to go and grab some driver data, display data, and has to call SDL get display for window, for the window to get its driver data here. And then it goes and grabs the display, uh, creates this atom called net active window and grabs that. Uh, it checks this X11 is window mapped. Uh, if it is, it creates this event um, and if it zeroes this event struct and populates it and then sends an event basically to tell it um, we need to raise this window or something and then it flushes the display for it to actually get that and then after that we flush again probably unnecessarily because it did it at the end but all that to say is that that's quite a lot of work compared to a single function call now I do think that this is again going towards that idea that it is hard to get a window to be raised or to you know to get to gain focus or something on Linux because the idea is not to let it do that. But still, I find it surprising just how much code there is. Now, there's a part of me that wonders if you know the whole point of using like li this is like a very low le level library, and perhaps the idea of using something like GTK is is this like C wrapper around the complexity that is X11. Uh, and you know they do have they, we we did see that there are functions in GTK for setting focus, but that's when you know you've gone ahead and created everything yourself, your GTK windows yourself, and that is you know not the case for us because the window that I'm interested in is not a window I created; it's the, it's the terminal from which you started, right? And uh, yeah, like I I can't. Um, I can't grab that and, and, and raise it. I can't make it actually work. So I tried, I tried to, you know, the code that I found online was very similar to this code. I have this kind of event structure in the send event and there's a raise window call. The one that, that's made up here, uh, no, not this one here, X raise window. There is a similar X raise window, which is without this prefix here that I do indeed call. I did the code that's pretty much in here. I did the flush and nothing that I did actually worked. You know, I can, show you a little bit of that code here so here like I so here's me trying to grab and this may be part of the problem I'm trying to grab the window like the the handle of the window that has the focus um, what I do is I call this is a total hack there but when we start this is the first thing I do is I call this function and I could have split this out, but whatever, I was just lazy and trying to get it to work. Uh, the very, very first time we come in here, I go and try and grab the handle, the console window here, the handle of the window that currently has focus. And this is some code I, I stole from somewhere um, that does some like X get input focus and whatever. So it just, this actually does return a handle. And then after that, you do this X raise window. And then here's this event um, to send to send to say, hey, we, we want to uh, to raise this window and then there's the X flush. And I tried a whole bunch of stuff and like no matter what I tried, it just never worked. Like, you know, I'd launch it like this. This guy gets focused because that's SDL that does that by itself. And I hit control C in here. And you can see that, like, you know, the cursor stopped and everything, but the focus is not here. It's still over here. You know, like I have to click here to get the focus. And if I say continue, the focus doesn't go back to this guy. So, yeah. So after all this frustration, I've decided, you know what? Screw it. I don't care. Like, if just if Linux wants to be, 
you know, if Linux is an environment where we just don't expect focus to ever switch or be stolen, even though I'm the one who spawns this this whole environment and everything, uh, I'm just gonna let it go. Like maybe revisit this at some point later, or maybe if somebody knows Linux programming and knows like X11 more than I do can can perhaps help me um, you know, take a stab at this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna like commit this on a branch and just push it and keep it for later. Uh, something I do a lot, right? Just to make sure that I don't lose anything. Because you know, there, there are useful changes in here. So let me actually, uh, yeah, let's do, um, let's do this. Cause I am a GUI person. Oh yes, and I had to add X11 for this to work in order to be able to call those X11 functions and link, and link against it. And then this is a whole bunch of code. So, all right, that looks good. We'll just check this all in. We'll check out branch and we'll call this um, Linux. Um, Set, set focus or whatever. Git add, git commit, and I'll just say work in progress or I'm trying to set focus, but it's not working. But not working yet. Okay, and we're gonna do a git, git push origin. Linux set focus. Great. So at this point, let's check out master. And now we should be clean. We shouldn't have any more of those changes. And indeed, they are all gone. I think I'm gonna have to do a CMake here. And let's just incrementally build this, make sure that we're, we're up and running in our normal state. Yeah, so if anyone is a X11 Pro and just wants to take a look at this, this code that I plopped together in here. The branch is right there and it's been pushed to GitHub. So there you go. Okay, some buzzing in my phone. Oh, nothing, uh, nothing dire. Whoops. Okay, so this, this looks like I built. And this is the uh, debug version, hence the slow speed there. So, you know, the idea now is you have to click here and I mean, everything still works, right? So, unfortunately, we cannot scratch off that next item that was on our list. So we'll just move on. So the next thing is execute shell command. Now, hopefully this will be a bit easier, but you know, you never know. You never know with Linux, um, but give it a whirl. So what is this execute shell command? So just as a point of comparison, if we go here in my platform layer in Windows, I call this function called shell execute. And the idea there is to just kind of run the default handler for whatever command that I give it. And what this is used for right now is just for two things. It's used to kind of to uh, open a link with the default browser like this and it's used to open a the readme markdown file so on windows if we were to run this a 
a uh, if we were to run it, I don't know why it's not working. I think I have a, a lock on my file. No? Access is denied. What I what I've got going on here. Succeeded, no failures. Looks like it created the, the executable. Why, why isn't this working? Oh, I'm such an idiot. Yeah, because I regenerated this and I gotta change the starter project. Okay, it was fine anyway. Let me uh, bring this over here. Okay, so basically, what it is is when you go into help about Vectrexy, you have these two links in here, so there's that the link to. Um, uh, you're not seeing it, but basically it opened over here. I'll do it again. I think now it'll open there. There we go. See, so I click there, and it uses my default handler for the browser. And if I click README, I actually don't have a handler registered for um, for uh, Markdown files. But I okay, you don't see it because this is not my primary screen. But I've got one of those. How do you want to open this file on Windows dialogs? And I can choose, let's say. Uh, notepad and then I'll get this uh, in fact you know I, I could register to always use Visual Studio Code and I think there we go see it just opened in Visual Studio Code here there's the readme so if I click it again it should just open there boom uh, so that's that's cool right that that's basically what I'm looking for to this is what I want to replicate now in Linux I assume there's a way to do this I, and I and I guess I'll be finding out um, so yeah let's let's see if we can't uh, get that working so I'll just start with equivalent I'll just search you know is there an equivalent to uh, Linux Equivalent shell execute, maybe without the colons. Alternative for shell execute in Linux. Linux equivalent to 132 shell execute. So let's just see. Uh, let's see here. Please use code that. Okay. System function. Hmm. Or if you okay, these will be useful if you want to display a web page with a browser, or you can use the same way I use to call any function. See fork. Make sure it's PID zero. Uh, okay, well he's specifically checking for Mozilla here. It's possible that like the concept of like a generic run something doesn't work in the way I think unless it's like a GTK level thing because you know like we go in here let's say we go into the file manager so what I'm talking about is you know we go into I don't know uh, in here when I double click a text file it opens in here, in this text editor, right? And if I open an MD file, I guess it's gonna use the same thing because it's been registered to use this text editor. But if I go into overlays, you know, I double click a PNG file, it uses this PNG viewer, right? So there's definitely things that have been registered. And then for things that are not registered, like say we go to ROMs, it knows it's some kind of binary file it says cannot display and then you can do select application right that, that's cool 
and you're gonna see face. So you view all applications, you could find something. So, so that that's okay, right? So that's like one way we can attack this. Of course, the other way we can attack this is like go a bit more specific and say, oh, I'm opening a URL or I'm opening a text file. And we we could make I don't mind making a you know adding a bit of information if it helps. Um, instead of execute shell command, maybe we could say like we could rename it and be like a open open file or something and give it the or maybe maybe we'll keep it execute shell command, but we'll give it some context. You know, like an enum, and it says this is a URL. We expect this to go to a browser. Uh, this is a, a text file. We expect it to use some kind of text editor. I don't know. So let's see if we could find our, an answer to what we're looking for. This here is a way, but I don't really want to do user bin Mozilla. That's not that's not that cool for me. Is there anything else? We could try system. in my question but the call you use is specific to the environment you're using for example gnome there are no true file associations in unix you are better off calling fork and exec is equivalent to spawn in windows exec whichever member of the exec family you want yeah that's sort of like the answer we, we saw over here, the fork and exec, except that it's probably not going to do the right thing if I just ex like if I if I just exec the thing itself and not an application that knows how to run it. Okay, so this is this is an answer. XDG open uh, opens the browser set as the default on the system with the website. So that's that's interesting. That's very interesting. XDG open. What is XDG open? Open opens a file or URL in the user's preferred application. Huh. Now that's cool. This might be our answer. And now what library does this depend on? XDG open. Arch wiki. Is this something that you have to install though? Or is like, can, or can we reasonably assume that XDG open is available? Okay, that's cool. So it's not a library, it's just an exec. It's just something we have to call. Okay, that's neat. Should we do basically, I guess we do system with it? Except system will not, will, will block, right? Which is not really what we want. Yeah, it returns after the, the command has been completed. Is it true though? Maybe we can. 
create a child process that execute the shell command, specified in command using uh, exec as follows, exec l, then shell. System returns after the command has been completed. During execution of the command, sig child will be blocked and sigint and sigquit will be ignored in the process that calls system. So I guess that's not what we want. We, we just want to spawn. We want to do this. We want to fork and then run and then get out, I guess. I don't know. Or maybe just call exec. Let's see. It replaces the current process image. Oh, okay, I see. So you do so I do need to fork in exec. So some, it's something like this would work. Alright. I'm just gonna move this over to my other screen. Probably should have opened it. I guess I can't, I can't open it in here. No, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so let's go to platform.cpp and we'll go to shell execute, or execute shell command that has not been implemented for Linux. Okay. I don't know which one of these I actually need, but I'll just do this for now. I'm not getting the client format sort. I don't know why the client format extension doesn't work anymore. It's totally working fine before. Control up F or control or Windows and control. What is that? Format document. Let me see if it, if it actually does something. Uh, control shift P. Format doc. Control shift I. See, it's not doing anything. What do you know? this pointing to an executable which is probably valid let's see maybe that's part of the problem oh no it's there I remember I had actually installed it and then maybe removed it. I don't know. Oh, I'm getting hot. I kinda don't feel like writing code if I know my, my formatter is not working. Let me take off my sweater.
Let's try, um, let's try something. Let's install Clang Format. Oh, there's even a version 6 there, eh? Which, what version is this one? It is version 6. Hmm. And the, the default one? Doesn't this add it to the environment? To the path? Preparing to unpack, okay. Setting up client format, processing true. So where does it go? Okay, so I see it installed Clang Format 6. Alright, fair enough. Which Clang Format 6? User bin Clang Format 6. Okay, let's try that. Just in case it's some stupid thing. No? Close and reopen. Oh, hey, Castro man. So do I know if there's some kind of equivalent of Clang format for VS? Absolutely, it's what I use. Here, back in Windows. Um, basically, just install the Clang format extension. So you go you know, go to extensions and updates and look for Clang format. And, uh, and then that's it, just install it and you're good to go. And then after that, if you want, you can go and like, look at the configuration options for it. And there's only one thing in there that I recommend changing, and it's something that I actually added to Clang Format, to the extension, I mean, um, a while ago. And it's this format on save. You know, you can turn it on here. Um, and that's all I do. I just turn this to true, and then that's it, you know? Then after that, if you have a Clang Format file in the parent directory, and it has to be in a parent directory, by the way, as I learned recently, so if you have a file like this, um, then you know as soon as you start typing and hit Control S and to save it'll reformat your code. Alternatively, you can you know there, when you install the the tool there, you get you get this Clang Format Selection and Clang Format Document in here. I added the second one, but Clang Format Selection was always there, at least originally there. So you can always like you know select stuff and then run the Clang Format Selection if you are only interested in that section. For me, I kind of like reflowing and formatting the whole file so that I know that it's always formatted and there's no like, I didn't miss anything. But that's just me and that's why I added that feature. Now that feature is actually like built into the Clang format extension in VS Code, which is what I'm trying to make use of. And I've had luck with it, but I don't know why it's been like not working for me recently. It's really getting on my nerves. See, look, and I'm not even getting any errors about it. I don't understand. What is going on? There's client format. Got the file.
Yeah, we should use this at work. It's funny you should say that because I was having a conversation about that just today with someone on my team saying that, uh, you know, that I would like to, 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 to do something like that. Oh, did they actually add Visual Studio? Huh. Oh, that's cool. See, uh, they didn't have Visual Studio as one of the styles. That's cool. See, that might help to get some buy-in for Visual Studio users. If there's like a default that actually works for them, you know? Because like mine is based on LLVM, but if you can write Visual Studio here and you pretty much get what Visual Studio gives you, that's probably gonna make a lot of people happy, right? Because then, uh, well, for Windows, for us who are working Windows. Oh, interesting. So it didn't like the fact that I had a, a path in here. So I put user bin client format like this. Oh, now it works. <laughs> what? Uh, it's been a little flaky, I have to be honest there. It's been a bit flaky. Let me just close some stuff here. It's, it's not working, it's, uh, it's running a little bit slow. No, last time, last time on stream it was running slow as well. And then I, after the stream, I looked on the system monitor and I saw that there were like extension processes running in the background, and that were like just chewing up CPU time. And I think it was that CMake thing that I had added. So here we have the Microsoft C, the the Linux extension now is using 50%. I think it's going through and probably like collecting. Collecting um, IntelliSense information. That's going to be my guess here. That's a lot of CPU. <laughs> hmm. Try something. Wondering if it's gonna actually die. Like I killed uh, VS Code. See, it's still running. Yeah, I'm just gonna be be bad and kill it. Okay, looks like it's all right now. All right. So. There we go, so it's formatting, it's reflowing my header files, which is great. All right, let's, uh, let's try and do this. is run XDG util.
And then these are the args in argv format. not set focus. What am I doing? It's um what's it called again? It's um shell exit there it is. gonna say char star con star is that okay can I do this it's not reinterpret it's cons cast that I want is it okay to pass it in like this? I think so. All right, so if this fails, whatever. Do I really, do I really care? Do I wanna know? Here, here, this is what we'll do. If anybody cares, they can check. Result of shell execute, whatever. Okay, so maybe this will work. Extension is still running, eh? I'm using a little less CPU though. Oh, there's a 32. <laughs> I don't know. IntelliSense now. IntelliSense MSVC Linux. Look, VS Code is VS Code. Okay, so let's see if this works. Fatal IOR 11, resource temporarily unavailable on X server. OK. 
Okay. That did not work at all. Maybe I misunderstood how it was meant to be used. Maybe I do need to call system from the other one rather than exit. Oops. No, yeah, he says exec here. Basically, PID will return zero when you are the forked version, right? And then you want to replace yourself with something else. Okay, that's why... Let me, let me read again how fork works. It's been years I haven't looked at it. Creates a new process by duplicating the calling process. The new process is referred to as a ch as the child process. The calling process is referred to as the parent. The child process and the parent process run in separate memory spaces. At the time of fork, both memory spaces have the same content. All right. Do I really want that? Is there like not a way to just, anyway, whatever. <sighs> This is the way to do it, right? fork and exec, which is what we're trying to do. These clone processes are subsequently initialized with a call to the exec family of system calls in order to run the new program. Fork creates the clone children and exec makes them eat their brains. These brain-eating clone children become zombie processes once they complete their execution. They'll linger around until the return value is returned to the parent process via the wait system call, or until the root process cleans up the zombie if the parent process is no longer running. Fork of the original Unix system call used to fork clone a process. It is still available in modern Linux systems, but it has been re-implemented as a delegation to a new system called clone with a particular set of flags. The clone system call is also used to create new threads within a process. More on differences between process threads in a future post. Here's a little C program that will fork the current process and call exec cd to run the ls command. We'll, we'll run strace to trace the system call to get invoked. Oh crap, our fork failed. This is the parent process. Okay, and then there's a wait. Okay.
And I don't really see why this isn't working though. I mean, technically, if this succeeds, we don't even... Yeah, like, I don't even need to check the return value of this unless it fails, right? Because this will replace us. Oh, I think I need to put a null in there. Okay, we can do that. And I put null pointer, what it was expect. Null. What else? Exec. CV. And what's the other one? The CVE with an environment. I guess we want to give it a clean environment we could. Clang format not working. What the hell, man? Try again. Same thing. I, you know what? I wonder if it's because we need to give it the full path. Could be. XDGU2. Oh, is it XGDU2? Um, what am I dreaming? What was it called again? XDG oh, utils. Could it be? No, XDG. XDG open. Oh, okay. I was just passing it the wrong thing. Alright, let's try that. Let's try to actually put the right thing in there. Might help.
damn it. XDG open. Which XDG open? Okay, let's try putting user bin. Just in case. Because I guess the path thing has to do with... Yeah, okay, I guess that makes sense, because path is really like a, a shell thing. And exec CVE doesn't know anything about that, right? I think? I don't know. Maybe? It's different from, uh, from how Windows works. Oh, okay, so this time it actually did call it. That's great. But it looks like we didn't it didn't get the argument. And also looks like Oh no, so that's it. It did do something separate. Okay. Interesting. All right, so it doesn't like the way we're passing in the command. I was trying to think, is this is this is this kosher? It's the address to a command. There's a string. Is there anything funky about that? I think so. Any arguments. Oh, I see. Wait. Okay, he passes. You have to pass itself in. Oh, yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Right, because arg0 is always the program itself, followed by other arguments. We'll get there. Understand, like it, it really does want an array of non-const chars, as we can see in here. Like what's what's the usual way to do this? Do you have to keep casting away constness? Or is it more like we cast it away at this level? It just seems kind of odd. Doesn't it? I wonder what the the, the the right way to do this is. Here we go. Compatibility with existing C code. Neither the pointers nor the string contents themselves are intended to be changed, though. Uh, you can get away with const casting the result of C string, which is what I'm pretty much doing. Yeah, okay. I have usually hacked this with.
Right, the other way is to cast the final vector. That's what I was wondering. Anyway, let's just see if this works. Really? No method available for opening that? WWW browser not found. Links to not found. Oh. And in this case, it used a terminal. <laughs> terminal is not fully functional. I guess I assumed it would work. I should have tested this. Like, XTG open. Hey, this worked. <laughs> it works from the shell. Hmm. What does that mean? What does that mean? And what about the, uh, the, the readme xdg open readme so this works so why is it that when i invoke xdg open using xxcve it doesn't actually work let's try it without the environment just in case the environment is actually important for this to work just want to rule that out oh yeah Like the environment is important. Nice. So I guess it, it inherits the environment that this was launched from, which would be the environment of the shell. So that's that that makes sense. Makes some sense anyway. I can I can reason reason about it. One, one question I have is what if I run Vectrexy, but not from a like what if I run it from an explorer? Do I get a terminal? Something I've been wondering. Can I even run it from here? Uh, code Vectrexy build. Cannot display Vectrexy. Why can't why can't I run this from here? I mean it's it's an executable. Oh, thanks, uh, Castro man. So, so here I am, right? I, I, when I ls in here, we can see that we have an executable, and in fact, I can run it from here. But if, but inside here, it lo looks like just a regular binary file. 
Is there like something magical I have to do to like make it runnable here? Or is, it, is this like a command line thinks, oh, maybe that's what it is. If it's like a command line executable, it needs to be run from a shell? I, I don't know. I don't know anything. See, same thing for VC package. I guess that's what it is, isn't it? I guess the idea is you have to open it with a shell? I don't know. Learning more and more about Linux. Um, Ubuntu can't run executable from file. What do they call it? Files. That's not exactly what I've got here. Bin and run? Really? Like if this was name.bin, would it make a difference? Is it, considers it a shared library? Shared library files. See, ah, oh, read and write. Read and write. Access. What about execute? Allow executing file as program. Set. So I guess here the idea is we just view things. I don't know. This might be like some kind of GTK thing about like how it works, you know? Like if we go to Okay, so not even bash runs from here. So I guess that's considered normal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, like, like if I ls in here, you know, it's it's, it's a it's, it is an executable because I compile it into one, right? I just when you you build it, it produces an executable with all the right permissions. Um, what about here? What's what's BusyBox? This looks like it can run. I guess there's like some kind of concept of like a shell executable versus a UI one. Why does that have like a different icon? In any case, it looks like we can't run any of these. So if you can't run these, I guess it makes some sense. It's 
snap pin code. So snap pin code is some kind of a link to VS code. Snap in VS code. User bin what? <laughs> the user bin snap. Install configure refresh and remove snap packages. Snaps are universal packages that work across many different Linux systems. Hmm. Enabling secure distribution of the latest apps and utilities for cloud service desktops and the Internet of Things. Okay, well, this is beyond what I care about right now. Uh, I'm fine with running it here. I just thought, you know, there would be a way from the UI here to just, you know, be able to run Vectrexy. But there seems to not be, so whatever. Um, okay, so let's see this again, because it's fun. And I assume that what I did is portable, I, I guess, I don't know. I don't really have many flavors of Linux. I'd have to install a few different ones to, to see if this works. I'll, I'll do that at some point. But for now, I think this is pretty good. I'm curious if we could like, <clears throat> if we could like do the casting differently. could even use Excel CL and pass it multiple parameters instead of Excel CV. Yeah, you know, that would be like simpler. Followed by a null. What's the difference between Excel and Excel P? Variadic functions, this pointer must be cast car star null. Uh, provide, okay, semantics. So CLE is environment, but what's the difference between CL and CLP? Anyone? Oh, it does look through path. Maybe now without the environment, it'll actually find it. In case you're interested, okay, let's check out this link from Castroman. Oh, this is about the like opening. It's called Nautilus. No exec, do, do not permit. This means your system prevents from running your program on your home, your test program on your home folder.
because Nautilus is patched to remove the ability to execute programs. It's a security pro problem. Put your desktop file in the right location for the application launcher and open it that way instead by using Nautilus. Huh. Okay, so it's for security reasons. And only when your program is a GUI program, coded for a widget toolkit like Qt, should you care to eventually be able to run it in your desktop with a click. These also can be specific to your desktop environment. You'll bother about that much later and you'll probably even sh should not and leave that burden to your user or to the package of your program. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's just the way it is on Linux basically and it's for security reasons. Thanks, uh, Castro Man. Appreciate it. That explains what's going on there, right? So I still haven't figured out the different what what the extra P is for. Um, I'm looking here at not fork at exec. Oh wait, path file. Okay, there is a difference. The P version says file, whereas the CL version says path. Okay. The initial argument for these functions is the name of a file that is to be executed. The consequence are arg and specific ellipses. It really doesn't help very much to understand. delineating whether the function accepts a fully qualified path or whether it accepts a file name which it searches for in the user's path okay okay well I definitely want to use the P version in that case I think that's more flexible so I want like exec LP I think and we want just like this and I suppose we need to pass it twice from what I've read Right? And then potentially just pass in command here and then null. Let's see if that's right. First argument should point to the file name associated with the file being executed. Still works. So I mean, I'm not cleaning up my child processes, that's for sure, but whatever.
Okay, well that's clean. We'll go with that. And do I really need this? I don't think I need stood IO. That was for the printf stuff. Let's go get rid of that. that for fork and doesn't need sys types okay Okay, well, the only potential thing is that we added bool as a return type, which we don't care about. So, looks good to me. We'll say implement platform execute shell command on Linux. Opens default browser and editor for links and for for link and readme. Respectively. Push us on Windows. Okay, that's fine. Implement platform. Shall I just get on this stuff? This we can push. Great. So if we go back to our list, where are we at here? We are now done this task. Let's we'll move it up. That's pretty good. So we we know I'll put later here because it didn't really work. Console color. I just don't think we're gonna we're gonna do this. I'll just maybe put, I'll put like later with a question mark. 
This I still need to look into, but these are kind of like packaging stuff. Which I, okay, so Travis CI pretty much already done. We'll do that. Deployment packaging. Yeah, this is still a, a question in my mind, and actually I have a note about it down here for CI deployment for Linux. So I'm gonna remove this here because I already have so it looks like I need Roar Audio installed. Or is it sound IO? I don't know. If there is this one dependency, this one runtime lib that I don't have by default uh, in Ubuntu when I install it, in, in, at least in 18. I don't know, like, am I expected to package this dependency? Uh, am I, is it okay to expect users to, to install it themselves? I don't know. <clears throat> I'll wait to get some feedback <clears throat> from Linux users. And then I have this verified that VC package can build glue on a clean Ubuntu with libstl2 installed without libstl2 installed. So I'll do this at some point off stream. But I think um, if I'm reading this right, I think we're pretty much done with uh, the Linux version, which is pretty cool. Like let's do a, before I sign off, let's just do a release build and um, I just want to do this here, release. What is it you don't like here? Oh, okay, I didn't like the fact that it's an extra C make there. We'll just switch it to release. I do have this like weird warning still. Not a weird warning, a warning because there's one C file that I'm building and I'd like to figure out you know, I'll make a note about it. I'd like to figure out how to configure CMake. Just gotta look into it. Um, so that it uses the C compiler instead of the C++ compiler for that one. Or maybe like runs it in C mode or something. There must be a, like a way to do that. Uh, it's for... to compile C files without to avoid. Okay, so I just added this CMake how to compile C files to avoid and then command line options, blah blah blah. I mean, this should be for the one file that we have, which is um, oh, the wrong place. The one C file that we're building right now is. Let me see it. Is in line noise. It's this one, line noise .c. So this is a C file, and, and it's being built with, with the C++ compiler with the same command line arguments like std C++17 in it, and GCC is just saying, hey, you know, it doesn't make sense to ask me to use C++17 when building a C file, apparently. I, I don't know. I don't know why, but so it is. Okay, so now we're running at a slightly more decent speed. Still not that fast. I wonder if I, if I was to close some stuff that like eats up cycles. This was running faster before. Let's see. Oh, here we go. I saw 60 FPS for a second.
I'm just looking at my main CPU usage on Windows and it's like, yeah, not great. Probably why it's not running fast. Because actually when I'm not streaming, this thing runs like at 100, 120 FPS, even within uh, VM player here. Oh, see, look, 72, 85. I just saw a couple of processes died, so now, now we're running at a much more decent speed. Just fast forward a little bit. Of course, I'd like to try this eventually in a native Linux environment, not in a VM, but you know, someday. I've been meaning to install uh, Ubuntu on one of my spare hard drives and like get some kind of dual boot thing going. Okay, this is cool. Looks like we're, uh, looks like it's working pretty well. The whole resizing thing works. You can open. Debug window here. Just like on Windows, we can open up wide like that. And then we can play around with stuff like this. We can make it faster. Like that. That's like the fastest. The way to make this go really fast is to basically enable max texture size and make the texture size much smaller. And you can see now. You know, there's a, obviously there's a, a visual, like if I go really small, I love this. <laughs> I don't know why. I love seeing it rendered at super low uh, resolution. It just feels like, you know, it got ported to like a, a tiny handheld with very low resolution. You know, like we're playing on Game Boy or something. Especially if I, if I take off the, uh, the overlay. Look at that. <laughs> Cool. All right, so guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here. Uh, next week, when we resume, I think I'm gonna start working on sound because that's pretty much the next logical step, unless I can get my hands on a on a Mac OS uh, on a Mac. I don't have one, but if you know someone would lend me one, I, I've, I need to ask around at work, see if anyone's got like an old Mac book lying around or something that I could just borrow to do this port. Otherwise, yeah, I think I'll start looking into sound and trying to implement that, which I don't know, it could be a pretty uh, pretty big task. I, I haven't really. Uh, I've done it for for the NES and that wasn't so bad, but I have a lot less information for Vectrex. So I guess we'll see. So yeah, thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you next time. <laughs>